thank you to the Stanford Alumni Association for inviting me to be here today. Thanks to all of you for attending. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk to Stanford alums from my completely objective perspective. Stanford alums are the smartest, most creative, engaged, and inspiring group of people out there. And of course, I was just reminded this um, uh, last month um, at my 30th um, reunion. I could, it was such an incredible experience, and I think I could spend my whole 30 minutes talking about it. But instead today, I'm going to tell you about the work that we've been doing on culture and emotion for the last 30 years. Um, this work really started here when I was an undergrad, where I met so many students from different cultures, um, including many other second generation Asian Americans who, like me, were born in the United States, but raised by immigrant parents and saw up close how culture could make a difference. And this is really what made me both personally and scientifically interested in how different cultural ideas and practices can shape basic psychological processes, including how we feel. So at the time I started doing this work, right after I graduated from Stanford, the social science literature was pretty mixed in terms of how culture influences emotion. On the one hand, there was work in anthropology um, that really concluded that emotions were most, almost entirely culturally constructed. And on the other hand, there was a lot of work in psychology that was concluding that emotions were almost entirely universal. But the problem with the anthro work was that it didn't measure, typically it didn't measure emotion very precisely. And the problem with the psychology research was that it typically didn't consider culture very thoughtfully. And so this made me as a graduate student and then later as an assistant professor really want to address the limitations in these two bodies of research. So we did a number of studies that tried to do this. Um, first, we brought European Americans whose ancestors were primarily from Western Europe, but whose families had been in the United States for many generations, as well as first and second generation East Asian Americans, particularly Chinese Americans into the lab. And we had them engage in a number of emotional tasks. We had them watch sad and amusing film clips. We had them relive different emotional episodes in their lives. We even had them bring their romantic partners into the lab to talk about areas of conflict in their relationship. And uh, you'd be surprised actually how easy it is to get people to argue even in the lab. <laughs> um, and while they were engaged in all of these tasks, we measured how fast their hearts were beating, how much they were sweating, we gave them questionnaires so they could tell us how intensely they were feeling different emotions. And we also recorded their facial expressions so that we could look at minute changes in their facial muscles. And I really believed that by measuring this um, emotion really precisely and looking at people who had different levels of exposure to different cultures, that we could really identify the specific ways in which culture influences emotion. But much to my surprise, study after study, we found really more cultural similarities than differences. I mean, honestly, this was just, for somebody who was interested in culture, this was kind of, this was depressing and, and frustrating and a real disappointment. But like all of those times, um, they're really important times because they make you reflect and sort of reevaluate. And it made me really rethink some of my assumptions about emotion and culture. And what I realized after many conversations with lots of people, including my partner and now collaborator and collaborator, Brian Knudsen, was that most of the studies that we had been doing and that were true in psychology were really focused on an aspect of emotion that we call actual affect. They were really looking at how people were feeling in the moment. And we started thinking that maybe culture had an even greater influence on how people ideally want to feel or what we call their ideal affect. And this is really at the time a very understudied facet of emotional life because people just assumed that everybody wanted to feel the same way. So we started asking people just in a very open-ended way, what is your ideal state? And you could put this in the chat if you want to think about how would you ideally like to feel we asked our European American, Asian American, and East Asian participants this question. And here are some of the typical responses we got. This is a typical European American student who says, I just wanna be happy. Normally for me, that means I'd be doing something exciting. I just wanna be entertained. I just like excitement. And uh, there's a lot of um, 
responses here that are reflecting this next um, response that was a typical Hong Kong Chinese participants response, which is that my ideal state is to be quiet, serene, happy, and positive. I see a lot of that in the chat too. Um, and so what you'll notice in these responses is that both um, students are talking about being happy, but they're really defining happiness in different ways. The top student is really talking about happiness in terms of excitement, enthusiasm, what we call these high arousal positive states. Whereas the second student is really talking about happiness in terms of calm, peacefulness, what we call these low arousal positive states. So we wanted to see whether we would find this at a larger scale. And so we created a, a questionnaire where we just asked people um, to use a five point rating scale, like the one you see here, to tell us over the course of a typical week, how much would you ideally wanna feel excited, enthusiastic and energetic? And you can kind of write that in the chat if you'd like, what number you would put. We also asked individuals over the course of a typical week, how much would you ideally want to feel calm, relaxed, and peaceful? And so we've um, administered this questionnaire to European Americans, Asian Americans, and Hong Kong Chinese. And in our first series of studies, we found these patterns that we've since replicated in many, many studies since. We found that European Americans shown here in red said that they wanted to feel excited, enthusiastic more than their Hong Kong Chinese counterparts here in blue. And the Hong Kong Chinese said that they wanted to feel calm, peaceful, these low arousal positive states more than their European American counterparts. Now you can see we've got the third group here of second, first and second generation Chinese Americans who were like their European American counterparts and that they wanted to feel the excitement states more than the Hong Kong Chinese, but they're also like the Hong Kong Chinese and that they wanna feel the calm states more than their European American peers. Um, so this difference here, we have found in all of our studies since, it's a pretty robust difference. And um, the differences in the calm states have changed over time. And right now we're interested in looking at what are kinds of the factors, you know, world events that might make everybody value calm states more, like the pandemic. <laughs> um, but this difference is really why when people ask you in the United States how you're feeling, the answer is you're feeling great. And um, it's the reason why you're looking for passion in your life or passion in who you love and what you do. I think those really um, reflect this cultural difference in how people wanna feel in the United States. And in the United States, we wanna feel these excited states. Now, we also asked participants how much you actually feel these states um, on average over the course of a typical week. And again, we find very few differences in how much people actually feel excitement states or calm states. But even when we do find those differences and we control for them, we really still find these differences in how people ideally want to feel. And that has really led us to do a lot of research, but build this a theoretical framework that argues that culture influences both aspects of emotion, but it influences how we wanna feel even more than how we actually feel. Okay, so we then launched a series of studies to really see, well, where do we learn? How do we learn to want to feel a certain way? And so you can sort of think to yourself, well, how do you learn which states are ideal? Um, you can also put it in the chat if you'd like. We turn to the media, which is of course the first place that everybody looks for messages about how to be. We looked at best-selling storybooks um, in the United States and as well as in Taiwan, and we coded the emotional content of those storybooks. Um, particularly, we looked at the emotional expressions of the characters in the storybooks. And we found that in American storybooks, best-selling storybooks, the characters showed more of these open toothy, what we call these broad toothy excitement smiles. Whereas in the Taiwanese best-selling storybooks, more of the characters show these closed, smaller, um, what we call calm smiles. And we found these differences um, in lots of other forms of media as well. When we look at um, um, best-selling women's magazines in the US and in China, we find that the covers of best-selling women's magazines um, in the US have more excited and fewer calm smiles. Um, we've um, recently looked at the official website photos of leaders in the United States and in China. And we find that across lots of different domains, government, business, and academia, Chinese, uh, European American leaders, US leaders, sorry, are six times more likely to show excitement smiles than their Chinese counterparts. So the idea here is that illustrators and um, publicists and advertisers 
choose images that reflect the cultural ideal. And then we as consumers of those images, we see thousands and thousands of those images on a daily basis, begin to internalize those ideals. We internalize them without even being aware of it. And then we reproduce them. And this has never been more obvious than when I was looking at the pictures from um, our 30th reunion. And so I'm just gonna show you some of them and see, see what kinds of smiles are on everybody's faces. These are what we call excitement expressions, big toothy excitement smiles. And um, I actually use my scientific skills and I coded the emotional expressions on everybody's faces in this image. This, these are photos from a breakfast that we had on our front lawn for reunion. 90% of the people who attended were showing these excitement smiles. There were some people who were showing the calm smiles, but only 10%, 10% of them. So um, we, we learn these and we reproduce um, these cultural differences um, in ideal affect. So now the question is really, why, why do these differences matter? And so we then launched a whole series of studies to really look at how ideal affect, both cultural differences and individual differences might affect our daily lives. And because I don't have very much time, I just wanna tell you some of the things that we found that ideal affect or how we wanna feel influences what consumer products we purchase, what kinds of exercise we prefer, how we define happiness and well-being, even how we view romantic love and um, whether or not we look forward to or dread old age. The general finding is that the more you value excitement states, the more stimulating versus soothing products you choose, the more likely you are to run and do high arousal activities um, than, than, um, than walk or lower arousal activities, the more likely you are to define well-being in terms of passion, um, and same thing for romantic love. And the more likely you are to dread old age because of course, old age is associated with declines in physical activity. So the point is that both individual and cultural differences in ideal affect influence um, our personal lives. But most recently we've been interested in how these differences in ideal affect might influence how we treat other people. And so that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of my time talking about today. About five or six years ago, we had this hypothesis that when we meet somebody for the first time, you know, we know that we make snap judgments about them. We like them, we don't like them, we think they're friendly um, or, or not. And our hypothesis was that if that person that we're meeting for the first time is showing an emotion that matches our ideal, that snap judgment will be positive. We'll just like them immediately. And so we wanted to see whether this was the case. We've done many studies where, and I'm just gonna tell you about the sort of the general framework of these studies, and I'm happy to answer any questions about the particulars um, during the Q&A. But we basically show our participants who are coming from different cultures and primarily European American and East Asian contexts, lots of different faces. And the faces vary in terms of their emotional expressions, but they also vary in terms of their race, white and Asian, and their sex, male and female. Some of them are computer generated like this one, um, but others are more our real faces like these. And we basically ask, um, in some studies, ask our participants um, to judge these faces. Um, in a series of studies, we looked at social judgments. So does ideal affect match influence whom we see as friendly, which might influence who we actually befriend? And we found that it does. So in, this is um, a summary of a series of studies, data from a series of studies where we find that European Americans shown here in red are rating those excited smiles as more friendly compared to their Hong Kong Chinese counterparts are rating them here in blue. There doesn't seem to be these differences in the ratings of the calm. We see it in some studies, but not in other studies. So overall, the big difference is in how people are rating these excited smiles. And this difference is really related to how much European Americans are valuing excitement states. Now, what's really compelling about these data is that this holds regardless of the race or the sex of the target it seems that the emotional expression is really what's mattering the most in terms of whether or not you judge somebody to be friendly, warm, trustworthy, and extroverted. And you can imagine that this would make a difference. If you're meeting somebody for the first time and you think that they're friendly, then you're gonna treat them really differently than if you, treat some, than if you meet somebody for the first time and you judge them as unfriendly or hostile. Now, the question might be, 
why, 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 what is going on here? What leads to this difference? And so we've turned to um, neuroimaging studies to try to get a handle on this. In the interest of time, I can't tell you about all the different things that we've looked at, but we've used neuroimaging to really identify what are the mechanisms that might underlie this difference, might underlie why European Americans are more likely to judge excited smiles as friendly. It could have something to do with how much you're identifying with the face or you know, um, how much you're attending to the face. But what we're really finding is that the answer lies in the reward mechanism, which is associated with activity in this part of the brain called the ventral striatum. Compared to Chinese, when European Americans see those excited smiles, they show greater ventral striatal activity. Um, and that means they find these faces more rewarding. Um, for those of you who don't know the neuroimaging literature very well, these are the same areas that are associated with addiction and feelings of craving. So that means that when we see a face that matches our ideal, we just want it more. We wanna interact with it more. And in fact, in a recent study, we found that the more activity that you see in this area of the brain, the reward area of the brain, when you're seeing these face, excited faces, the more likely you are to actually have excited friends um, on social media or people who are showing excitement in social media. And that leads to then these cultural differences where the European Americans actually have more social media friends who are showing these excited smiles than their Chinese counterparts. So, these cultural differences in ideal affect matter for whom we see as friendly and whom we actually befriend. And you can see, imagine that this would then have all sorts of consequences for how we treat people, whether or not we share resources with them, and maybe even whom we hire and whom we choose to lead. And this is indeed what we found in our studies. So um, in one study, for example, where we're looking at um, financial giving, we use a dictator game, which is a, a behavioral economic paradigm where you give participants a certain amount of money and then you ask them to just sh they, they, to share. They, they don't have to, but they, you give them the opportunity to share some of that money with different targets. And of course, again, we give them different targets that vary in terms of their emotional expressions, excitement and calm, um, race and sex. And what we find here is that the European Americans, again, here in red, are more likely to give money and share their money with the excited recipients than are the Koreans here in blue. And there's no real difference in terms of overall giving to the calm recipients, although you can see that the European Americans are giving more to the excited than the calm, and the Koreans are giving just a little bit more to the calm um, um, than the excited recipients. Now, again, this holds regardless of the race or the sex of the target, as you can see here. So this is with all of the excited recipients, and this is the males and the females. These are the white, and these are the Asian recipients or the targets. And you can see that no matter what their race or, gen or sex profile, the European Americans give more to the excited recipients. And then here you can see that, again, the Koreans really aren't differentiating between um, Aren't, aren't really different from European Americans in giving to the calm recipients of different sexes and of different races. And they end up giving, again, more, a little bit more to the calm than to the excited. But of course, European Americans are giving more to the excited than to the calm. We've replicated these findings with other behavioral economic games like the trust game. Um, and I'm happy to talk about those more um, during the Q&A. We've also um, presented participants with scenarios where they're um, asked to think about hiring somebody. And again, they're shown different targets who are all matched in terms of their qualifications. And again, here you see that the European Americans are more likely to hire the excited targets um, than their Hong Kong Chinese counterparts. The Hong Kong Chinese are more likely to choose um, to hire the calm versus their European American counterparts. And then again, European Americans choose excited more than calm. Hong Kong Chinese choose calm more than excited. We find similar findings when we ask people to choose a leader of their organization. And this seems to be particularly true during um, times of growth. Okay, so these cultural differences in ideal affect really matter for how we treat others. And here's just listed um, a, whole, a whole different ways in which this occurs. And the next question then is really um, why this matters. And um, I think this matters for a whole host of reasons but particularly in multicultural societies like the United States, but of course, all over the world, 
where we're in constant contact with people who are coming from different cultures, which means that they're coming from cultures that value different states. And that just increases the likelihood that we could be misjudging people who are showing emotions that their culture values, but that our culture doesn't value. In fact, I think this is what happens to Asian Americans. It's, what, it's what's happened to Asian Americans historically, and it's still true today, where you can hear Asian, um, people talking about Asian Americans or having stereotypes of Asian Americans as being stoic and as inscrutable, um, as hard to read. But that, I think, is a reflection of the American ideal more than it is even the reflection of Asian Americans, of course, because if, if Americans are valuing excitement, that many East Asians are valuing calm, then that's where the misunderstanding comes in. And the problem is that can lead to a lot of um, inaccurate judgments at best and at worst disparities and discrimination. So um, for example, we know that minority applicants are less likely to be hired than majority applicants. And this is true for Asian Americans as well, regardless of the strength of their educational qualifications. Um, we also know that there's a bamboo ceiling, there's a limit to how far many Asian Americans can get in top leadership positions despite being highly qualified. You hear people say things like, they just don't have what it takes to lead. And I think that's code for, they're not showing the emotions that they need to show um, in order to lead. And of course that's culturally defined. Um, and finally, we know that there've been lots of anti-Asian hate crimes and I think those are easier um, there's a whole host of reasons why that's occurring, but it's easier for them to occur if you think that your target or, your, or the victims are not uh, human, and that's easier to believe if you think they don't ha that they're not emotional, when in fact they're just not showing the emotions that are valued by the majority culture. So um, this matters, and this is why we're doing a lot of work to try to really understand what are the conditions under which ideal affect match matters most. If we give people the opportunity to deliberate and to really think about their choices, does that seem to change how much they use their ideal affect when judging other people? And the, I, I think the good news so far is that for European Americans in the United States, the answer is yes. Um, do cultural differences in ideal affect influence other ways of expressing emotion? We just published a paper that talks about how these ideals play a role in what people post on social media as well as you know, what they respond to in social media. I'm happy to talk about that if anybody has any questions. We've also, since we've been doing this work for um, over 20 years, um, we've been interested in how cultural differences in ideal affect have changed over time. Like I said, the differences in the valuation of excitement state seems to be very robust, but the differences in the valuation of calm seem to be um, less stable. And we're really interested in understanding why. All of our work has focused on um, pretty much European American, Asian American, and East Asian samples. Um, depending on who's in the lab, we've looked at other ethnicities and cultures, but there's so much more work that needs to be done. And I'm really eager to hear about the ideal affect of the cultures that you're most familiar with and that you're living in. And of course, we've only talked about um, high arousal and low arousal positive emotions. I have lots to say about negative emotion if you're interested in those as well. And then of course, these studies um, are just looking at specific samples and we're, we're really interested in looking at how gender, how culture interacts with other um, sources of cultural variation like gender, age and social class. And then most importantly, we're hoping that um, teaching people about the cultural differences in emotion can make a difference. And that's why it's so important that you're attending um, this webinar today. So what to remember? Um, I hope you remember from this uh, webinar that cultural factors shape how we want to feel even more than how we actually feel. And that in North American contexts like the United States, there's a real emphasis on excitement states, but that's not necessarily a value that's shared by East Asian or other non-Western contexts. Um, these differences in ideal affect at the individual level, because obviously there's lots of variation within each culture, as well as at the cultural level, really predict what we do personally, as well as how we treat other people. And, um, it, you know, we often know about stereotyping, um, racial stereotyping and sex, uh, gender stereotyping. I mean, it doesn't mean we're really good at combating them, but we're at least aware of them. But I think oftentimes we're not aware of really how culture influences what emotions we value. Instead, we think people are just showing or what emotions we express. 
people just think that emotions are what are human and they are human, but they're also, because they're human, they're also shaped by our cultures. So these cultural differences in ideal affect have important consequences for how we treat other people, which may intentionally or unintentionally result in racial and ethnic disparities and discrimination in multicultural societies like the United States. So I wanna end by thanking all of the current as well as the former members of the Stanford Culture and Emotion Lab. I hope some of you are out there. I know at least a few of you are because you contacted me. None of this work could be done without all of the, the hours and hours of hard work by thousands of research assistants and uh, students, um, graduate students. I wanna thank Stanford, our, the National Science Foundation and all of our other funding sources. And um, I wanna thank, and oh, I wanna say as a shout out to the former members, if you haven't been in touch, it's never too late, please send me an email, let me know how you're doing. And if you're interested in supporting work that really helps us understand issues related to Asian Americans, I wanna direct you to this website down here, um, SASE, um, so that you can promote more research on these topics um, at Stanford. And to learn more about the work that's coming out of the lab, this is the website here. So thank you so much for your attention. And I'm gonna turn um, this over now to Tanya, who is going to uh, moderate the Q&A. Thank you, Jeannie, for such a fascinating uh, presentation. And let's jump into questions right from alumni. Okay, let's see here. Um, we have a question here. Are there evident gender differences in ideal effect within a given culture? This is such a good question. And uh, we, we had it too. We thought that there might be. Um, so it might be interesting to think about like, what, what do you think the gender differences might be? But what we've been surprised by is how few gender differences we found. It might be because our questions have really focused on how much do you ideally want to feel these states on average? And there it seems like um, there, there are few gender differences. But when we look at how people want to feel in a particular moment or a particular situation, that's where I think we might find more gender differences, which is what, it, um, what the rest of the psychological literature sort of suggests. As I said, we've been looking at now lots of data sets that, that, that have been collected by us and other research teams over the last 20 years. And um, as we're accumulating that data, we'll be able to look in a much larger sample of like 20,000 participants to see whether or not maybe there are gender differences and what are the particular circumstances. But so far, we haven't found them much to our surprise. We have a question here from Vanessa, uh, but where did the differences begin? Why are Europeans more geared towards excited faces? What's embedded in the culture that gives greater weight to excitement? Is, did you say that Vanessa? This is such a great question. I'm so glad you asked it because of course I didn't have time to talk about it. So we've done a series of studies trying to answer this question early on. And what we, what we found is that they're really associated with larger cultural differences in individualism and collectivism. So how much you um, value the individual and put individual needs over collective needs versus that's individualism versus how much you put group needs over individual needs. In individualistic cultures like the United States, um, your goal is really to change your environment to reflect your internal preferences and desires. That's what, that's what you're supposed to do in individualistic context. And um, our, our hypothesis was that if, you're, if your goal is to influence other people, that involves high arousal states, right? It involves action, action involves high arousal states. So the more that you want to influence and act on your environment, the more you should value these excitement states versus in more collectivistic cultures where the emphasis is less on influencing and more on adjusting to other people. So the idea is that you have to adjust to what people are um, expecting of you, demanding of you, and that initial adjustment requires a decrease in arousal, right? You have to suspend action in order to assess what people around you want. And so in order to adjust to other people, then you really need to, that really involves these low arousal calm states. So if you wanna influence other people, which is encouraged by individuals to cultures, then you should value these excitement states. Whereas if you want to adjust to people, which is encouraged by these collectivistic contexts, then you should value these calm states. And these are the links that we found in both our survey studies, as well as our experimental studies. So that's a long-winded way of saying that we think that, that we found that they're associated with larger differences in individualism and collectivism. 
We have uh, several questions. Is there research beyond East Asians and Europeans, like Blacks, Latinos, mixed race, uh, which is you know predominant in Hawaii? As I said, this is such an important question. And um, I've had different students through the lab, Jayana Bolds and um, Alexia Charles and others who've, who've been really interested in looking at ideal affect in African-Americans. Jayana, what was so interesting was she had predictions that you would find differences um, between African-Americans and European-Americans, but she really didn't find any. Then she went to other, she thought maybe that's specific to a Stanford sample. So then she went to um, some other colleges and also didn't find the differences. So, um, but that's just, you know, the tip of the iceberg. I think there's so much more research we could do. There have been other teams that have looked at um, Latinx cultures and found that even though Latinx cultures are collectivistic, they value, you know, the high arousal positive states. And I would say that's because the form of collectivism is a little different than the East Asian collectivism. We've also done studies looking at lots of different East Asian and Western contexts because, because of course there's a difference between Korea and Japan and, and uh, Taiwan versus, and similarly between um, France and England. Um, and so we, we see variation, um, but overall the Western contexts are valuing the excitement states more than the East Asian ones. But I agree with you, there's so much more work to be done and, and I would love to do it. I just need people in the lab who are more cultural informants and, and who can uh, lead those studies. Great, thank you. We have a question here from Hillary Chan. Now, what can we learn about the strengths of different cultures to ameliorate the increasing levels of anxiety and depression in our youth? This is, this is another really important question. I, um, I have lots of, thought of thoughts about it. I'm not, I don't have that much data about it, but I would say that um, based on people's open-ended responses about what makes them excited, the times that they were the most excited in their lives versus the times that, that they were the most calm. These are, these are some um, studies of Stanford students. The exciting times are times that are pretty rare. You know, it's like winning a national competition, getting into Stanford, um, going on a date with this person that I've been wanting to see for so long. Whereas the calm events are things that are, are more mundane, but they're like reading a book or going on a walk with a friend. So my, this is again, my speculation is that when you come from a culture that's valuing excitement states and excitement and passion are hard to experience all the time, then maybe that makes people feel like, feel that they're not achieving the ideal and that makes people depressed and not feel good. But if we had a more diverse happiness portfolio where you were taught to value lots of different positive states, including the states that are easier to create on a daily basis, maybe that would do something to reduce some of the depression and anxiety that people are feeling that are fed by Instagram and different forms of social media where you're seeing people who are showing these big excited expressions all the time. I think people think that that's what Maybe our youth think that's what people are experiencing a lot. And if they understood that that's just the ideal that they're posting, it's not actually, it might not actually, and it's probably not how they actually feel. Then maybe that would help, help adolescents as well. It's a really we important question. question. We have a question here from Drew. What about credibility of, of leaders, smile versus calm? Um, credibility, do you mean, is this, did you say Drew? Drew, I don't know if you mean like their competence or, um, but we've been really interested in leadership, um, as I said, and um, you know, a number of people have asked, well, are there certain conditions under which we want more excited? We, the US wants more excited and Hong Kong Chinese want more calm leaders. Um, I thought, I was really curious about this, obviously in, in the past presidential elections, you know, why are we deciding what leaders we want? Um, how are we deciding the leaders of our countries? And what we find is that these ideal affect seems to matter more under conditions of growth. You know, when things are going well in businesses or in research labs or in, in government, then we pick leaders that match our ideal affect. So European Americans choose excited versus calm over calm leaders and Hong Kong Chinese choose calm over excited leaders. But then when conditions are unstable, um, are unfavorable, um, where you don't really know what's gonna happen next, that's where you don't really find a preference for a calm or excited leader. In some cases, it seems like you want a neutral leader. And maybe that's because you want somebody who can really respond to whatever 
is is going to happen in the moment um, um, because the conditions aren't good, and so maybe you rethink, you know, um, sort of your past prescription for for a good leader. Um, but we're really interested in that question, and we're we're you know trying to answer it right now. Um, it's it it is influenced by what you who you think is going to be the the most competent. And under conditions of crisis, I think you you don't know who's you're just open to lots of different alternatives. How might interviews for college admissions be impacted by how the interview assesses the interviewer assesses the applicant's interest, enthusiasm for their studies, for the college, for school, or life in general? This is another. See, I told you this is why I love talking to Stanford alums. You guys ask the best questions, and they actually, you know, they generate new research questions in the lab. Yes, I'm sure you're talking about Harvard and uh, the case against Harvard, um, which found that there. Um, was not a bias against Asian Americans, but in admissions, but interviewers um, rated Asian American applicants as having less positive personalities. And I think that our differences have everything to do with that. That if you come from a culture that values excitement and you're interviewing somebody who was taught to value calm, then you're gonna judge them as not as engaged or motivated, or as we know from our work, warm and friendly and, um, and extroverted. And that can lead because we're a culture that values all of those qualities to a less positive personality. So, um, and I think this is really important again, because again, I think interviewers aren't intentionally doing this. You know, they're just, in, they're influenced by their cultures and they're unaware of how their culture is rating somebody else's emotions. We meet somebody for the first time. I meet Tanya for the first time and I think, oh, she's just so warm and friendly. I don't think that, well, that's true based on her expression, but it's also because I come from a culture that's valuing excitement. So when she shows excitement, it means that I really like it. So I don't think the interviewers or the raters are doing it intentionally, but I think they need to think about how their judgments of people's personalities, especially warmth and friendliness and trustworthy and extroversion um, are, are shaped by how they've been taught to want to feel. And um, so I think it's really important. We have a question here from Lorraine. Um, did you look at the differences in responses to people in distress? So we've done some studies, this is a good question, where we've looked at how people express um, depression. Um, so European Americans and Asian Americans, this is some early work where we brought depressed and non-depressed into individuals into the lab and showed them different emotional film clips. And the typical finding in the depression and emotion literature is that depression blunts your emotional responses so that you, you, you're not as responsive, you're not laughing as much to an amusing film clip. Um, but what we found, and we found that that was true for our European American participants, but we found that for our Asian American participants, it was the opposite. They were actually more responsive to the clips. And so that made us really think about ideal affect and more generally norms about emotional expression and what happens when people are in dis distress, particularly uh, depression, depressed. And so what we think is that when you're depressed, you can't engage in the cultural ideal. For European Americans, that means not showing as much, not expressing as much, not showing as much excitement. But for Asian Americans who value calm, that it's the opposite. They're, they're, not, they're not showing the calm ideal and, um, and they're much more reactive. Um, we have looked at people's conceptions of, of distress, and um, we found that, that, maybe not surprisingly, that people define distress as the opposite of their ideal. So in the same way that if you're valuing excitement and you define happiness as excitement and passion and fun and all of these high arousal positive states, you define depression as the opposite of that, not having that, being dull, bored, and sluggish. And similarly for Hong Kong Chinese, that if you're really defining happiness because you value calm states in terms of these calm states, then distress and depression is really defined as the opposite of that. So it's being anxious um, and uh, nervous. We have a question here from Kia. I'm wondering to what extent a specific uh, temporarily spatially bounded context will influence performance of emotional state. To what extent do people mimic the immediate context effective cues? This is a good question. This is a question about what role does the situation play in all of this, I think, Kia, if that's, if that's what you're asking. And, um, okay, great. So um, we have 
you know, we have looked at some of these processes in particular situations. The studies that I talked about earlier, where we were looking at the link between influence and excitement and adjustment and calm were, were done experimentally where we across cultures had people want to influence their partners. And then we found that they had a preference for excited states. And similarly, people who, you know, um, we put them in situations where they wanted to adjust to other people and that made them prefer the calm states. But we haven't really done studies where um, we've changed the emotional uh, demands of a situation and then seeing how ideal affect makes a difference. The closest that we've come to that is what I was referring to earlier, where we've done things like had people deliberate a little bit more um, before they decided who they were going to give money to. Like they had to either engage in a cognitive tax, taxing task or which would, which would lead to less deliberation or a more, a less cognitive taxing that would allow you to deliberate. And there we see, like I said, that um, European Americans are, are then less likely to use their ideal affect when they're deciding you know, how much money to give to a target. What's interesting is for our East Asian samples, um, particularly our Chinese samples, even deliberation seems not to make as much of a difference. The other way in which we've looked at the situation is we've looked at what happens when we give people information about a target. So, you know, um, what happens when you, you learn something about a person from other people, like this person's really trustworthy or this person's not trustworthy at all. And then you sort of see their emotional expression. Do you use your emotional expression more in determining whether or not you're gonna to give to them or do you use that other information about how trustworthy they are that, that other people have given you? And again, it seems like European Americans are more likely to use other people's you know, descriptions of, of the target's personality more than they use the emotion. And that, um, that again, that our, in, in this case, our Taiwanese participants, they use both types of information. So that's the way in which we've looked at the immediate situation. But I agree with you, um, there's so much more work to be done. The, the other studies we've done is to like get people in a positive mood or get people in a negative mood and then see how that influences um, their decisions, but we don't have any um, data on that yet. We haven't finished that project. We have a question here from Scott. Is there evidence that individuals prefer excited faces, even if they're not happy, happy excited? And do we respond to all kinds of excitement? Oh, that's a that's another really good question. So, you know, we've the way in which we've operationalized excitement has been pretty much um, through both static and dynamic images um, of the face. And I guess we've used the voice too. Um, but we really haven't done careful studies where we've changed different aspects of the excitement expression to see you know, what people are responding to the most. In the neuroimaging studies, it's really the whole face. But I think that would be really interesting to do. Um, I don't, you know, Gestures is another way of doing it. In addition to the voice, gestures, the face. Um, I'm not sure if, if you have other ideas, you could write them in the chat. Um, but I think that's a good question. What are you the most responsive to? Um, and and we, we haven't had a chance to really look at that yet. There's a, a question about uh, from Lewis and he talks about like, what is the huge difference in eye contact between like your Asian relatives well, let me just kind of read it. You, you haven't spoken yet about the huge difference in eye contact as you've learned by the difference between your Asian relatives compared to what you've learned in the US. Yeah, eye contact is, um, yeah, another one of these features in all of our um, stimuli, people are looking straight, you know, um, straight ahead. We're, we haven't looked at um, gaze aversion. But yeah, there's a lot of old research showing that, that of course, in the United States, we're taught to look you know, look straight in the eyes of a person, whereas in many East Asian cultures, it's a sign of respect to look down. And I definitely experienced that personally. I remember that I would do that. I'd look down and people would think I was depressed or there was something <laughs> wrong with me. Um, so I, I think there's a, a lot of work that could be done on that. We haven't really looked at the differences um, in gaze aversion, um, but, but that is another cultural difference that, would, that um, would have lots of consequences, you can imagine, right? If somebody's looking down and um, that's being interpreted as being um, avoidant um, and um, passive and not assertive, and that's a negative thing, you know, in that context, and that person's not going to get a job or get hired or it's going to be judged negatively. 
but likewise, you know, on the other, on the, on the other uh, flip side, that if somebody's looking straight at someone and that's read as a sign of disrespect, then that person won't get the job either. So yes, another source of um, cultural difference that would be really interesting to look at. Yeah, several questions about age and um, what was the research control for the age? Um, what age groups does your, did your research cover? Oh, and a great question. I knew it was going to come up because it's such a good question. So we've looked at, you know, our initial studies were on college students, of course, but then we also did studies looking at, we've also done studies, this is Jenny Louie and Eva Chen, um, looking at preschoolers um, at Bing and at a comparable university in Taiwan. And um, because we were interested in, you know, how early do people start learning these ideals? And so, of course, we couldn't give our participants, our preschooler participants, um, our self-report questionnaire. So instead, we showed them two faces, a, 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 a smiley face with the big, broad, excitement, toothy, broad, um, excitement smile, and then another face um, with a calm smile. And we asked our three to five-year-olds how much, um, which face they'd rather be and which one they thought was more happy. And we found that the European American kids were more likely to choose the excited face compared to their Taiwanese counterparts. Asian Americans were right in the middle. But then, so we've, we've gone as young as three to five, and then we've gone as old as eight, 80 to 95. So we have studies where we've looked at individuals, um, it's cross-sectional work, so it's not following them over time, but we were interested in, you know, what happens when you get older. And um, what, this is a lot of work that's been done by my colleague, Laura Carsonson and others that shows that as we get older, um, there she's got longitudinal data, we actually experience less negative emotions. Um, and um, the, the degree to which we experience excitement emotions doesn't seem to change. And then we experience more calm emotions as we get older. But what about ideal affect? There we find um, that there's more cultural variation as you might expect. So for our European American participants, our 80 year olds value excitement as much as our 20 year olds. And, and you can see that in like popular advertisements about healthy aging, you know, you see older adults doing bungee jumping and <laughs> climbing. Um, but in our Hong Kong Chinese and our Chinese American older adults, what we find is really interesting. They tend to, it seems like they're adjusting their ideals, both the excitement and calm ideals that they don't wanna feel them as much. And so in some ways what's happening is that the discrepancy between how they're actually feeling and how they wanna feel is, is less, is smaller than it is for the European Americans in older adulthood. And we know from other work that the closer you are to your ideal, the happier you are. So, um, so it's interesting. So for all, for both European Americans and Hong Kong Chinese and Chinese Americans, as you get older, you get closer to your ideal. But for the um, European Americans, that's mainly because how you're actually feeling is changing. It's not really due to a change in how you ideally wanna feel. But for the Chinese Americans and the Hong Kong Chinese, that's, it's, their, their actual affect seems to be changing and they seem to be also changing their ideals. Now, again, this is cross-sectional data. So we really need longitudinal data to really see if this is what's going on. But, but I think it's really interesting. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Can, can one ideal effect be changed if an individual changes their cultural surroundings at an early age? Yeah, so this is another great question and one that we've been really wanting to um, explore. We know from our studies that the more oriented you are to American culture, the more you value the excitement states um, among different Asian American um, immigrants. And so that sort of suggests that the more time you spend, you know, the more you, in, you endorse the values you know, of, of your host culture, and in this case, American culture. But we haven't really followed that up. You know, we haven't really followed people um, over time. Actually, in our last um, NSF grant, we were supposed to do it, but then the pandemic hit. So that made it really hard to do. But we were gonna follow people right when they came to Stanford. And then we were gonna follow them up over time to see how their ideal affect might change. Work by my colleague, Batya Mesquita at um, Leuven um, in Belgium, in Belgium um, suggests that emotional changes in your emotions and your ideals are the last thing to change as you're acculturating to a new culture. And, um, and so we wanna see uh, whether that's the case, but um, there's also, you know, some just anecdotal evidence that, that 
more and more now, since it's easier to travel all over the world, that you might, because there are lots of individual differences in a culture, let's say you're in a culture that is valuing things that you don't value and the emotions that you don't value. Um, Eric Weiner talked about this in the geography of bliss. He wrote about these hedonic refugees, you know, who might be going to different cultures that value the states that, that uh, they value more. So I think it's really interesting about how it changes over time, depending on the culture that you're in and then how you may actually decide to be in a particular culture that's closer to what you value. I have a question here. I understand that Asian Americans used to score as depressed using American psychology tests due to this bias. Is this still the case? Wow, this is, gosh, you guys, maybe you were in all my classes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so again, another thing that we've been really interested in is looking at the affective content of, of typical measures of depression and anxiety, other forms of emotional distress and well being. And um, what we found is that, and so these are popular um, self-report instruments that are used both in research and clinical settings. And uh, we just took like every item in each question and we coded like, what kind of emotion is this? And what we found was that in the most popular measures of well-being, a lot of excitement states were being um, represented. I mean, all of the items were really pretty much about these excitement states, and there were very few that were about these calm states. And so that's fine if you're using those measures in um, cultures or in contexts that value excitement, but if you're using them to measure well being in contexts that value more calm, then you're missing a huge slice of emotional life. And then actually, everybody values calm states to some degree. So you can, and so again, what I, the point I wanna make is that the scientists and the clinicians who are creating these inventories are just creating inventories based on what they think of as well being. And what they don't realize is that their culture is influencing that. So it's influencing what kinds of questions that they put on these inventories. The problem is that often those inventories are just translated and they're exported to other cultures. And so then you have these studies that are looking at you know, well being across the world using a measure that was created in the United States and that is a reflection of American ideals. So there's, there's been more attempts and efforts now to try to create different kinds of scales that can reflect um, the, the different cultural ideals. There's a, a, a piece of mindfulness scale that was developed by some Taiwanese researchers. And so, but still the vast majority of the studies are really using these well-being measures that were developed in one context and just translated and exported to other ones. The same thing is true for, um, for depression and um, other forms of distress. And that might be one of the reasons why Asian Americans seem to score higher you know, on those inventories. Um, not, that might be one um, reason because they're not able to really talk about the states that maybe they value more. But another reason is uh, has to do with negative emotions, which we haven't talked about at all, but um, what we know is that in the United States, European Americans really wanna maximize positive emotions and minimize negative emotions. But in many East Asian contexts and for many Asian Americans, there's more of a balance. You still wanna feel more positive than negative, but you value the negative states more. And I think that valuation of negative is why you're, you're more inclined to report the negative states, right? If you're Asian American or for anybody who values negative states, because we know that desirability is part of what influences whether or not how you say you feel, which is why it was so important in our work to differentiate between ideal and actual affect. So, um, so anyway, I, the, the, this is a long-winded way of saying that I think um, it's more and more people are acknowledging that ideals are influencing how people are creating these inventories and how people are responding to these inventories. And so that you can't take just differences on a well being measure or a depression and anxiety measure at face value without really looking at what's the content of those inventories and thinking about, you know, how does that contact really um, represent, you know, what's being valued maybe um, in the cultures that are, are completing them. Here's a question from Scott. Is there evidence of how people feel if they do or do not frequently achieve their ideal effect? And do subjects differ according to whether they think they do achieve the ideal? Well, this is a, a great question. So like I said, in our studies, we always administer measures of ideal affect, how much people ideally wanna feel these. And at the same time, 
how much they actually feel these states. And what we find is that um, people report wanting to feel more positive than they actually feel and wanting to feel less negative than they actually feel. That's true across all of our samples. But of course, as I've been saying, there are cultural differences in really the specific positive states that people ideally want to feel. Um, and what we know is that across the cultures, the greater the discrepancy there is between people's actual and ideal affect, the more depressed they are. But what's interesting is, and, and hopefully not surprising after hearing this talk, is that the type of discrepancy that's the most associated with depression varies across cultures. For European Americans, it's really the discrepancy in the excitement states that's predicting depression. For Hong Kong Chinese, it's the discrepancy in the calm states. And then for Chinese Americans, it's the discrepancy in both you know, that's associated. If you, the greater the discrepancy, the more depressed you are. But I don't know if people, how accurate those self-reports are with people's behaviors in their daily lives. I think that's a really interesting question. In psychology, we really talk about different kinds of reports. There's self-report that people are providing. And I would argue that with emotion, that is, matters a lot. But there's also informant reports, you know, what other people say about you. And um, so it would be really interesting to kind of look at that, you know, how your judgments of how close you're achieving the ideal um, relates to other people's judgments. Um, but no, we haven't done a lot of research on that, but I think it's, it's a really interesting question. So for just one last question, um, you know, with the pandemic, many of us have been wearing masks. What impact has that had on culture and emotion? Yeah, so this is um, when, the, <laughs> so long ago, <laughs> it feels like it's been so long. When it first hit, we were starting to wear masks. Um, in the United States, you know, people really ask a lot about this. Of course, in East Asia, many parts of East Asia, it's just, um, you know, part of winter season that you wear masks or when you're cold. And it's, in, it's um, and what I said then, and we have, we're collecting data now, but we're, we're not done yet, is that um, for Americans, not European Americans in particular, not seeing the smile is really problematic because that smile is so critical, as I've been saying, to um, our judgments of who's friendly and who's trustworthy, it's rewarding. And so um, the prediction is that the wearing the smiles would have a more, more of an impact on people's judgments of friendliness and trustworthiness, maybe. And then that might lead to general feelings of safety, you know, um, in the US and in other contexts. But now things have changed. It's so interesting, you know, over time we're getting used to wearing the masks a lot. My kids just are fine wearing the masks. We watched the Nutcracker a few nights ago and the performers were all wearing masks and it didn't phase them at all. <laughs> so, um, so that may then mean that we're really focused on other parts of the face more like the eyes, which we know East Asians do face a little, um, focus more on the eyes than, than um, in U US um, context. So it'd be interesting to track that and see whether or not that's changing over time. It's a great question. Well, thank you, Jeannie, for sharing your research on how culture influences our emotions. Great, thank you. Thank you for all the great questions and thank you so much for attending. I look forward to seeing you all back on the farm.